Okay, there we go, we're recording. And the participants. All right, we are live. I'm just gonna to check to make sure that people can hear us. Where's the chat? Can you chat in and make sure you can hear us? We're AA Spokane. That is disabled. Darn it. We can hear you. Okay, good. As long as I can. I'll work on that in a minute. Okay, we'll get going here in just a couple minutes. Looks like we've got about 23 participants. We're expecting close to 45. So we'll give it a few more minutes and then we'll get started. From the beginning, and I two questions. Actually, the, the chat was disabled for whatever reason, and so they were chatting through the Q&A, so. Got it. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, it's just a couple minutes after, so I think we'll go ahead and get started for the benefit of the ones that are here. Welcome, everybody. I'm Stephanie Aiden, Executive Director with AIA Spokane, and we have a great webinar uh, scheduled in our next um, iteration of Remote Live and Local. Um, we have the title of our presentation is Encouraging Inclusive Play through inclusive playground design, and it's being presented by SPVV Landscape Architects. Um, this particular course uh, has been approved through AIA for one HSW credit. Um, what I really need you to do if you're an architect and want credit is go ahead and email me at AIA, or excuse me, office at AIAspokane.org with your membership number, and I'll go ahead and get that recorded. So um, I just want to kind of introduce you a little bit to who will be presenting from SPVV today. We've got Ann Hannenberg, who's principal and also landscape architect, and uh, Jenna Yakis, uh, who's a landscape architect. And then our moderator is Ken Van Voorhees, who's a principal at SPVV. So they will be um, your experts this morning um, on all of this great topic. Uh, we do encourage Q&A throughout the presentation. Um, there is a Q&A um, button at the bottom of your screen or maybe at the top. Go ahead and send those in and Ken will moderate those questions and pose them um, as uh, they become relevant to the presentation. And um, that being said, um, you all know why you're here. Uh, you, you saw the course description, so I won't go through that. But since you are getting credit for this course, I do wanna go ahead and, and list the learning objectives real briefly. Um, and number one, the participant will learn the key concepts of inclusive playground design and how to accommodate differently challenged users. Number two, discover the advantages of overall environment uh, in inclusive playground design in urban park settings through accessibility. And number three, understand the appropriate use of playground and site features that include sensory stimulation for physical, socially challenged users. And lastly, explore the benefits of multi-generational inclusiveness and play in social and physical development. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and turn it over to um, Anne and Jenna and let them take it away. 
Okay, Stephanie. Um, and thank you everyone for being with us today. Um, we, we wish we could see you. Um, this is, uh, we're just kind of rolling with the flow and uh, tr testing out this new way of sharing information um, within our industry. And we're really happy to be here. We're gonna be talking about inclusive, an inclusive approach to playground design. Um, let me see if I can get this off. Oh. Sorry, let's see, beginning, thank you. Um, we're gonna be talking about an inclusive approach to playscape design, and um, now we need to get it out of presenter view. And will you go make sure I can see that? I can't quite see. <clears throat> Technical challenges. Um, I can't. Hey. Hello, everyone. This, this is Ken. Hey, Stephanie, real quick, um, got a couple of questions. Could you post your email uh, for the AIA uh, from one person? And that's it. Okay, so while I am getting this on uh, regular view, we're going to be focusing on inclusive playscapes, but I think you'll find that the information presented here is is pretty easily translatable to uh, many of the projects that you're working on, whether it's interior design or architecture or landscape architecture. And that's the goal. So I'm Jenna Jockus. I'm a landscape architect and playscape specialist with SPVV. Been in the industry for 20 years now, and 16 of those years I've been specializing in nature-based play, learning, and therapeutic landscapes for children. Um, I do uh, playscapes, custom playscapes, nature-based playscapes, sensory gardens. I've done some indoor playscapes. Um, <clears throat> and particular to this discussion, inclusivity is always an approach that I work from for every project that I work on. And um, for the 16 years I've been specializing in playscapes, I've also been studying um, autism and how to design really supportive environments for children with autism and also sensory processing challenges. So I'm going to be bringing some of that information into this uh, discussion as well. And I'm Ann Hannenberg. I'm one of the principals here at SPBD Landscape Architects. And uh, I've been in the industry now for, oh my gosh, um, about 20 years as well. And um, my specialty has been therapeutic landscape design, uh, specifically for aging. Um, however, there are a lot of parallels that, that happen with design for children as well as design for, for people who are uh, challenged that are seniors as well. And uh, I'll kick it over to our moderator, Ken Van Voris, to introduce himself. Thank you, Ann. <laughs> uh, I'm Ken Van Voris, uh, principal at uh, SBVV Landscape Architects, and I will be uh, reading your questions and injecting them appropriately when uh, we think it's in the conversation. But I do encourage lots of questions and we'll try to get it answered as quickly and in the, in the manner that's needed. So thank you. Great. So for this, today's session, um, I'll be giving the, the main part of it, the discussion on inclusive playscapes, and that'll be about 30 minutes of your time. And then um, Anne's gonna take you on a tour. It's been pre-recorded, but a tour of the Providence Playscape which is the inclusive playscape at Riverfront Park. Still under construction, but the majority of the playscape is in place and it's really exciting to take a walk through there. And then um, if we can't get to all the questions during the live discussion, then they, we're leaving some time at the end for uh, any questions that may come up. And then back to the learning objectives, we wanted to give you some bite-sized um, learning objectives here. Most of my discussion will be focusing on the key concepts of inclusive playscapes. And within that discussion, I'll be talking about why we need these playscapes. We need them as part of our urban environment. We need them as part of our park systems and why this approach is really critical, not just for children, but for all people. Um, I'll be talking about why playscapes have to engage, not just the five, but there's seven senses that we need to address. And then um, getting beyond the bench, um, considerations in getting uh, various generations out and engaged in play activities. And I'll go into that later on. So for this presentation, I'm going to ask everyone to think beyond the term playground. Because when I say playground, um, 
guarantee most of us think of situation or a structure setting like this image. And uh, play structures, playgrounds, the traditional model of playground design, um, you know, it serves its purpose, but these playground structures historically have focused on physical play activities for able-bodied children. And um, up until maybe five, seven years ago, um, that's what they were focused on, but playground manufacturers, to their absolute credit, have been very innovative and creative in um, addressing sensory engagement to the extent that man-made um, features can. Um, they've been proactive about um, making their uh, playground structures and settings more inclusive. Um, but I'd like us to talk in terms of playscapes. And for me, that's much more of a free form and open-ended term. Play is the primary activity of childhood. And so places children find meaningful play experiences can come in many forms. And I'm gonna show you some of these throughout this presentation. So nature play areas. Um, hybrid environments of traditional playground models with nature-based features, indoor playscapes, sensory gardens, um, art parks, arboretums, botanical gardens, children's museums. There's so many different places. Learning landscapes, outdoor classrooms, we call them learning labs in this office. And I show this particular slide because for children, play and learning are one and the same. And so how do we bring an inclusive approach the design of learning landscapes and the school environment. So really, I want to broaden our view of play and show you a range of possibilities about how inclusivity can be brought into the places children play. So as a broad framework, inclusive playscapes do three important things for children. First and foremost, this approach takes a holistic view of children's needs. Um, they're physical, cognitive, emotional, and social needs, uh, their developmental stage, their age, and those two may not be in tandem, uh, their diversity or diversities. So an inclusive playscape is really responsive to and supportive of the whole child in context of their diversities. Second, these playscapes provide equitable play experiences, and I'm gonna go into that particular topic here in one of the guidelines. Um, they also encourage social interaction amongst all users when children of all abilities have the opportunity to play uh, alongside one another, to socialize, it can break down barriers, fears, misconceptions on both sides, right? It also allows them to develop an understanding and appreciation of one another uh, about their strengths and challenges, and, and this really builds the empathy muscle that is so important to teach in childhood. And then third, um, any playscape must provide degrees of challenge or degrees for a child's perception of risk. So if you don't provide enough challenge, um, kids get bored, kids use the structures and the features in the ways that they aren't intended and that's when accidents happen. Um, so you have to provide for challenge and, and childhood is all about expanding one's abilities in various ways. Again, the physical, cognitive, social and emotional ways. Um, so an inclusive playscape must provide for degrees of challenge because of the wide diversities of children playing there. Uh, challenge is tied to mastery, and that's tied to um, building social skills, building all sorts of um, skills, physical skills. It's tied to self-confidence and empowerment. So you can see um, there are some really compelling ways why we need inclusive playscapes and why as designers we need to take inclu inclusive approaches to many if not all of our projects. Hey Jenna, we, um, while I, we we're taking a slight little break here, I got one question about wood chips as an acceptable base surface for inclusive play. So Ooh. I was wondering if you could maybe address that in your... In your yeah, you know, I've got... Um, Actually, in the next slide after this, I can interject an answer to that. So the question is about wood chips being an accessible surface and inclusivity. Is that what I heard? Yes, that's correct. All right, cool. Okay, so I will get to that answer. Um, so there's no cut and paste set of guidelines um, for inclusive playground design. There's 
Um, that's why guidelines are in quotations. Um, there's a couple of excellent books I'm going to give you um, in our resources and references at the end of the, uh, at this uh, session. Um, there are several of the large playground manufacturers have really embraced inclusivity and have developed kind of their own approach and set of guidelines. Um, one's based on um, the seven principles of universal design. Uh, the other has developed a booklet based on um, a panel of experts and community consensus. So that's all amazing information, all very useful. And so I've kind of collected that and, and um, condensed all the common threads in these guidelines, but I'm also kind of weaving in what I've learned in my 16 years of studying and designing for autism. Um, some of that information isn't readily available um, quite yet, so I'm, I'm adding that to this topic for inclusivity because it deals with, you know, invisible challenges and in neurodiversity. So the seven guidelines I'll be talking about, and I've got a couple slides per each, is accessibility, safety, and comfort, equitable play experiences, flexibility and variety, readability and messaging, degrees of social interaction, sensory engagement, and multi-generational considerations. So first and foremost, um, accessibility, safety, and comfort. Um, this is like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We need to make sure that what we design, the environment, um, addresses the basic needs of accessibility, safety, and comfort. And those needs have to be met before a child can fully engage in a play experience or a child or a parent can um, have their anxiety reduced and, and let their child engage, fully engage in that play experience. So accessibility really starts beyond the playscape. You know, do people know about the inclusive playscape? Is it advertised? Is it, does it have great signage? Um, is there adequate um, parking? Is the route from the parking area to uh, the playscape, is that um, accessible and direct? Is the playscape on a bus route? All of these things have to do with accessibility. Um, here's where I can answer the question. So inside the playscape, we have to go beyond the minimal standards of accessibility. And here's the example, um, and it's a great segue to that question that was just asked. So the surfacing here, this is poured in place. It's fully accessible, even for the most challenged um, in mobility. Um, so the question was that wood chips versus poured in place or tiles, perhaps. Um, what's the accessibility? Well, wood chips is actually considered an accessible surface. But if you've ever tried to roll a child in a stroller or a wheelchair or yourself in a wheelchair across wood chips, it's stinking challenging. Um, so if you talk, if that's minimum. So that would be the minimum requirement is wood chips. But if you truly want to make a place inclusive, a playground inclusive, you have to go beyond wood chips and look at perhaps tiles or ideally, we love poured in place in this office. You can do so many things to it, as you're gonna see. This is a picture from the Providence Playscape. You can do so many cool things with poured in place. Um, so anyway, I hope that, hopefully that answers the question. Um, I'd be happy to expand on it if I need to. Um, safety. Um, public playscapes have to be designed to a set of standards. Um, the CPSC Public Playground Safety Handbook is one. There's various ASTM regulations, um, ADA regulations, of course, and then depending on um, what facility you're working with, what licensor you're working with, and what age of child you're working with, there may be additional requirements beyond that. Um, but one of the things in terms of safety that I wanna point out is that for inclusive playscapes, these are ideally perimeter, they have perimeter fencing, uh, non-climbable. Um, so one example, and the reason for this is, is you know, you, you might uh, figure out to keep the children contained and to keep non-desirable folks out of, of this space. But um, one example I want to give you is, um, you know, perhaps a, a mom brings her child who has autism. Um, maybe they have some sensitivities with sound and loud noises, you know, startle them or in, in intense situations they get startled. Oftentimes with a child with autism, their tendency is to bolt or to run. And if a playground is fenced, then that mom or that parent knows that if something unexpected happens, 
their child is contained and their child is safe. Um, along that same line, inclusive playscape should have a single entry and exit point. And again, that's for safety and supervision, surveillance, and it gives that child and the, and the parents that sense that this is the way in and out. The mom can let her child roam freely, have more independence, play as they choose without worrying and helicoptering that they've got to be on their child all the time if their child is to stay safe. And then finally, comfort. There's various ways in providing for comfort. But the one, if there's one single takeaway for comfort I'd like to make is the absolute need for shade because shade is often overlooked in playscape design. Um, shade needs, can be provided in multiple ways. Um, mature trees, shade sails, structures, anything like that that provides cover. Um, and ideally they're placed where children will be spending lots of time in one place, like a sand play area or a water play area or, you know, any place, depending on the design of the playscape. Uh, we all need escape from sun and heat, um, but more and more children are on medications that make them photosensitive uh, to the sun. Um, their eyes hurt uh, when the bright, you know, the sun is bright. Um, their skin burns faster because of the medication that they're on. So providing shade is, is actually very much part of, of safety, just as, as much as it is for comfort. And then one item um, based on my um, work in the autism realm is a concept uh, that I'd like to talk about called previewing. And this is just as important for the architects on this webinar as landscape architects. And so previewing is allowing a child to view into, without entering, allowing a child to view into a space and a social interaction without being uh, thrust into that um, situation. So they have an opportunity to observe what's going on, to make sense of what's going on, then to make a decision for themselves that whether or not that situation is something that they want to participate. Maybe they do, or maybe they, it's not for them that day, they're already feeling overloaded and they want to go do something else more, you know, cozy space time. Um, so giving a child an opportunity to preview a situation gives them more success in that environment. So here's a landscape example, a playscape example. Here's a nature-based play setting. Um, you know, for most children, it takes a little bit of interpretation on what uh, possibilities and play experiences exist there, but for a child with autism, it's not super intuitive. Uh, they may not understand what potentials exist there for them. So giving them space, whether it's a little shady nook or, um, you know, the upper picture with the climber, you know, maybe they want to sit on top of the climber, maybe they want to sit under, but it gives them a good space to sit and observe um, what's happening, um, any social cues or agendas that are happening. So that way they can feel more comfortable um, and give them more opportunity to feel like they can enter into that and participate into that play experience. Okay, the second guideline is um, equitable play experiences. And so um, this is all about the playscape um, meeting a child where they are developmentally in context of their diversity, any diversity that they may have. Um, it's not about giving children equal play experiences because not all kids want to go to the top, of the, the top point of the structure so that they can go down the tallest, fastest slide that there is. Not all kids want to do that. Um, for example, a, a child in a wheelchair, um, here's a great image. So here's a sliding opportunity, exciting experience where they can go to the entry of the slide there's a transfer station that they can get out of their wheelchair with dignity and onto the top of the slide. They can go down the slide. And then at the end, there's a space for them. There's a widened exit here where they can scooch to the side and allow kids to continue playing. And they sit there, they interact, all while waiting for their mom or caregiver to bring their wheelchair down to them. So what a great and easy solution. A sim something as simple as a sand table can be the place where children get to know one another, um, appreciate each other, and build empathy for one another. 
And so, you know, sand play, um, often thought of something that's at grade play, but that's not accessible for a child uh, in a wheelchair or with mobility issues. So, you know, we've been using sand tables for a long time, and there's for really good reasons. Um, so, you know, our challenge as designers is to make sure that we maximize the opportunities to have for children to have experiences just like this. Um, and that may take some re-evaluation of the way things, of the way uh, that we've always done things. Um, and that's actually a great thing to do. Equity is also, equity essentially is about giving children and families what they need to experience success, appropriate challenge, and empowerment. And we need to remember, sometimes it's not the child that has diversity. Sometimes, Sometimes it's the parent or the caregiver um, or the teacher that has the diversity. And so imagine, um, you know, do you think that this mom here in her chair would be able to engage to this extent in our traditional playground model with wood chips as the servicing? Flexibility and variety. Um, flexibility is all about um, providing um, settings within the playscape that provide for multiple uses. In this case, the shelter is an outdoor classroom, but it can also be a space for art activities, horticulture therapy activities. Um, you know, kids can bring sidewalk chalk out, uh, sidewalk chalk out, and you know, draw on the hardscape. So think about your settings and your playscapes um, and how they can provide for multiple activities. Variety is about providing a range of settings and features that can be used in as many different ways as you can think of, um, providing um, different interests, different experiences. Um, on the left is a sensory path. This is at Bemis um, Elementary School here in Spokane, um, which it provides variety in the ground plane. Um, it provides a difference in visual and tactile experiences. And the projects I've included, the sensory paths, and the teachers say, that it changes the way the children move through the space. There's hopping and skipping, but there's also more like slow, kind of methodical, intentional movement as they explore the different materials. So, and then on the right, providing something like loose parts, the ability for a child to manipulate their environment to suit their play needs is absolutely essential. Um, so the more loose parts that you can have in a play setting, the more opp opportunities for play, exist and the more opportunities for social interaction exist. Readability and, and uh, mess messaging, excuse me. So readability, you know, think about Kevin Lynch's book, Image of the City, and his discussion about the value of landmarks and pathways and nodes and all of these things that contribute to environmental readability. Um, entrances. Uh, Entrances need to be uh, something that can be seen from a distance as a car pulls into the parking lot. They see where to where the entrance to the playscape is. It's also seen from within the playscape. So this helps orient a child where they are in their environment, um, especially if they've got a diversity that makes um, environmental readability something of a challenge. Um, also, landmarks um, within the playscape play features are important. But if you can provide views to the greater landscape, the surrounding, whether it's something uh, in the natural environment or something in, to the built environment, then children have an opportunity to um, look outside where they're playing, and then that helps orient themselves. Um, but the main point is, for all of us, being able to orient oneself, especially when an environment is unfamiliar, um, it reduces stress and it reduces anxiety, and then they can engage in their play, ex uh, play experience more fully. Messaging, um, if I could give one takeaway uh, for uh, the auto, uh, autistic population, is when you do messaging, make it simple and clear. Um, the example would be the upper right image, the touch and smell garden. That communicates how that space is to be used. And so when a child, um, when that message, you know, if they're of reading age or if they need to be read to, then that communicates what that space is for and what, the, what they can do there. Um, you know, I encourage Braille, um, universal icons are really important, but there's also opportunities to be playful in your signage. 
Um, the image, the sign on the left, I absolutely love because that really engages a child's imagination. It gets them interacting with the environment and it gets, gets them kind of a sense of wonder. Like, can you really hear the water travel from the roots to the leaves? I don't know. Let's try it out. So, um, for messaging, you know, you can work with your client, collaborate with them and put in a messaging system um, that is tailored to their mission and tailored to the children that they serve. Degrees of social interaction. <clears throat> a play setting must offer spaces for varying degrees of social interaction. Spaces for larger groups, um, smaller groups, spaces for one-on-one -on -one, um, time with a parent or a therapist perhaps, and spaces for children um, to be by themselves. Having spaces that provide different degrees of interaction can help a child build their competency in social skills, um, communication, amongst many other things. And the one thing I'd like to point out um, relative to autism is the importance of a cozy space, or if you can get several cozy spaces into your setting. Um, these are essential. Um, they're important for kids of all abilities, quite honestly. Um, they give a space away from the activities uh, that might be going on, personal space where they can um, just be by themselves and have some quiet time. But for kiddos with autism, they need these spaces, quite honestly, if they are on sensory overload, if they're overstimulated in any way. A cozy space allows them their own little bubble where they can go um, kind of destimulate and self-regulate so that they can get find their balance and then perhaps if they choose to go back out into that um, social setting. Sensory engagement is a huge one. Um, and I, I do like, entire webinars on sensory engagement, especially what it means for children with autism because it's a really complex um, topic and kiddos with autism and sensory processing challenges um, there's their uh, the input from the environment um, their their sensory perception and processing can be very different from what we think is typical so I don't want to I can't I don't have time um, to go into that topic um, but these are the five senses that we all know and love and as designers I'm sure you're already thinking of ways that you've seen or done uh, incorporated um, accommodations for sight, uh, tactile experiences, sound, smell, and even taste. Um, but there's two sort of less common um, senses that I want to talk more about. And um, that's the vestibular sense and the proprioceptive sense. And so <clears throat> the vestibular sense or system is located in our inner ear. If you've ever experienced vertigo, that's your vestibular system it, like really imbalanced um, and it the vestibular system is is related to where your head look your location of your head and your orientation of your head relative to gravity so are you right side up are you upside down are you sideways um, that's your vestibular system communicating um, about what's happening with you so vestibular activities are swinging spinning um, running rocking uh, balancing, those are all good to build um, vestibular, to give vestibular input and to build that system. Proprioception, um, that's actually the only sense in our body that doesn't require outside input. It's all internal. So proprioception is um, how your brain communicates to your muscles, your joints, your tendons in doing activities. It has to do with body awareness, uh, where you are in space relative to other objects, like walking through a room and walking past the table rather than bumping into it. But proprioception also has to do um, with the force that's needed to do any particular activity. So for example, being able to pick up a um, paper cup of water without you know, water going all over the place, that's a proprioceptive activity. So these um, proprioceptive uh, play activities have to do with push-pull, you know, wheelbarrows, wagons, this little fellow with the watering can. Um, balance is another proprioceptive uh, activity. So we need to provide for all of these seven senses. 
And then the last point is multi-generational considerations. Way back at the beginning, I mentioned about getting beyond the bench. And what I mean is that oftentimes uh, when we say, well, we need to accommodate for parents or grandparents at the playground, oh, let's put some, a couple of benches in the shade. We're going to orient them so that they've got the best view of the playground so that they can watch their kids. But you know what? We need to do better. Um, more importantly is being able to encourage mom and dad, grandparents, whoever, to get off the bench, put their phone away, and get out and engage in their child's play experience. In order to do that, we need to go back to the first guideline, and that's making sure we've met their basic needs of accessibility, safety, and comfort. Uh, a parent will, uh, is less likely to engage in their child's play experience if they're still worried about those basic needs being met. So there's so many beautiful things that happen in multi-generational play. Bonding and connections, support, increased appreciation and empathy, time spent in playfulness and joy, um, I love the image on the right here. Um, when people of different generations play together, there's wisdom, information, and perspective that's passed from one person to another. You know, traditionally we think of the elders passing this wisdom to the youngsters, but in a playscape, in a playscape, uh, the youngsters have the opportunity to pass their wisdom and their perspectives to their elders empowerment, self-confidence, being heard, so essential. So we should never minimize the power of these experiences or the good that it brings to all involved. And I wanted to leave you with just, this is just a tiny handful of the resources and references that I've used over my 16 years. Um, the top two I would point out for the architects on this webinar if you want more information about designing for autism, I would start with those two. Uh, these are all evidence-based design uh, resources on uh, designing for autism. The second one is an architect out of University of Cairo who's developed um, evidence-based guidelines for autism and it's worldwide. Um, and then just some other references. Don't ever hesitate to contact me if you want more information, I'm happy to share. But I think um, now I'm going to uh, turn you loose with Ann Hannenberg. She's going to take on this second part of the webinar. Yeah, um, sorry, right. do, you, do we have questions? Yeah, just before you jump away from that, um, Jenna, that was uh, wonderful. I do have one question. We've got a, a Larry, I, I apologize if I mispronounce your last name, Kaluza. Um, he's asking questions uh, regarding guidelines and basically to summarize, what are the guidelines uh, for integration into an existing park? Are there any guidelines associated well, with that? Um, so the CPSC Public Playground Safety Handbook, which can be found as a PDF online, that would be the place to start. And, and that talks um, not maybe necessarily about retrofitting, but um, will give parameters on, on how that may be done and, and just what the resulting playground will have to adhere to for safety. Okay, let me see if I can get out of this. Any other questions, Ken, that have rolled in? It's all good now, so Great. go ahead. Okay, so um, before we play the um, video walkthrough of the um, Providence Playscape, um, I just want to acknowledge that, um, you know, Providence was, was a major, had it not been for Providence stepping up uh, with a very significant donation, um, this Playscape would not have, have uh, come to reality for our community and our region. Um, they were a huge player. The foundation was a huge player. City of Spokane, parks, um, and many other um, user groups and, and people that had interest in this, you know, were a part of the design of this playscape. Um, there was a lot of outreach that occurred and uh, design charrettes that occurred. And I think the big one to mention too is Diane Scanlon out of, uh, she's out of California and she's with Shane's Inspiration. And it was actually Diane who was responsible for integrating all of the parts and pieces of, of what we heard in the design charrettes and uh, into the design itself. And then SPDD took Diane's design and launched it forward uh, through construction documents. And then we are now in construction. And uh, I think, you know, Ken, Ken has been a, a big part of this as project manager. And I've, I've uh, 
been the principal in charge of the project. But as we go through the video, think about the things that Jenna has talked about in her presentation. Um, you know, everything from what is the sense of arrival? You know, what, how is the accessibility? Or do we have bus stops nearby? Do we have, you know, easy access into the playscape? Um, and then all those different sensory aspects that she was talking about, you know, look at how that is, um, is integrated into this playscape. And uh, we're excited to answer any questions that you have too afterwards. So let's go ahead all and, right. and roll with the video. Let's get it going. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Jenna Jockins and I are from SPPD Landscape Architects. I'm Ann Hennenberg, and we are really excited to be here this morning to share with you the West Habermill Island uh, playscape. Um, and just want to share with you how the park really meets the needs of um, people of all abilities. And uh, where we're currently standing, just to orient you, this is Post Street right along here. And uh, the Post Street Bridge, which is currently under construction. And then this will be the entrance to the park and the parking lot where there will be uh, wayfinding signage. Also, ADA accessible parking because most of the people that will be utilizing the park um, have special needs. Um, they may be arriving in vans, and uh, so we need to make sure that they are provided for. SPVV works very closely in collaboration with Diane Scanlon and the Shames and Inspiration Organization out of California in designing this special playscape. We're really excited to share it with you today. So we've entered the site and people will access the park on the Centennial Trail, which is currently under construction here. Um, it was intentionally graded at a 3% grade right in here so that it's easier for families that need to use wheelchairs or maybe uh, grandparents or individuals who need walkers, any type of um, auxiliary equipment for ambulation. So we'll go ahead and we'll just continue on into the park. So we've arrived at the playground. And uh, some of the things right off the bat that you might notice is that the walkway is of an integral colored concrete um, so that it's not highly reflective. It's also a medium broom finish for skid resistance. And it also flares open to welcome people to the site and to the playground. The playground will be fully fenced for security. Um, and there will also be signage, very playful signage, um, that welcomes kids and their families as well, right out here um, at the front entry. So come on in. So some of the unique things, as soon as you arrive to the park, that you'll notice is these blockouts here uh, in the concrete that will be um, Symbolic for the kids, so we've got butterflies. These are going to be tiles that are actually embedded into the concrete. We've got butterflies, we've got birds, um, there are also fish, um, and this integrates and weaves throughout the entire park. Um, over here on the left hand side of the park, we've got uh, multilingual um, signage, which is really I think it's one of those things that we really need to be mindful of in design is reaching out to people of all uh, populations and uh, whatnot. So we've got the signage, everything for the safety surfacing is poured in place. And this particular part of the park is um, really geared towards sensory for the children. So you'll see a lot of play equipment here that is um, working with sound. Um, and of course, all of it again is fully accessible for the kids. Um, they've got things that are interactive. So that's one thing. And then we've also got benches for parents and loved ones to be able to sit on and interact with their children. Um, in the court in place, we also have um, stepping stones and the illusion of. Um, of logs that they could jump across or walk across. And then of course there's a hot spot uh, that is also in the form of this uh, butterfly. And I'll say that you'll notice butterflies are a common theme throughout the park. 
And that is paying homage to the um, Expo 74, which is where we are currently sitting, was actually the very first uh, playground that was part of Expo. Um, and it is now on this site. And so it's a way of just gesturing to the history of this moment. So this is another feature that is all inclusive for um, kids and their families. And it's fully wheelchair accessible. And it's a spinner that the kids can get in and actually spin together, which is one of the things that is a goal for this park, which is to make kids of all abilities feel as though they're included with maybe their able-bodied siblings or their friends. Um, and like I said, you can get in. It's uh, such that parents can get in with their kids. There are two places for wheelchairs to lock in place. And then the kids to spin the spinner like this, and uh, just a really fun piece of equipment for them. And as we continue through the park, we come over to this area here. Again, where audio is really important, so sound and also hand-eye coordination and working together. So we've got a rainmaker right here that makes the sound of rain as it moves. There's the concertines. Lots of fun for the kids. And then we move into this area of the park. And this is um, almost like pogo sticks in a way for the kids to uh, play on and move. It's uh, reminiscent of grass. And then we also have a spinner over here. So the kids are able to get up on the spinner and uh, their friends and family can spin them around. And again, this is really good for movement. Um, working with kids that have uh, challenges, you know, physical challenges, working with their hand-eye coordination, their motor skills, um, working with vestibular um, type aspects is really, really helpful for their well-being. And it is designed throughout the uh, park, you know, to be able to integrate that in. So as we continue on, speaking of that, this is a wobble pad, so the kids can actually get up on it and they wobble. And that, again, is moving, you know, and that's to help with the vestibular aspects of them. Mm -hmm. And then over here is an abacus, a stone abacus. And what I, what I would point out to you too is that a lot of this equipment can be used on both sides. So let's say you have a child that's in a wheelchair or let's say it's a family member in a wheelchair. They can work this side of the abacus while another person can work it on the other side. So there's that whole inclusiveness. This is Jenna on the other side of the camera. This is great for proprioception as well because You've got rocks that have a certain weight. So there's push-pull. They're using their joints and muscles. Great for proprioception. This is what an occupational therapist would work with. As we continue through the park, so this area will have a large shade tree located in here. And again, benches for family members to sit and integrate and work with their, um, be part of their loved one. Over here, We've got two sets of slides, or not slides, excuse me, swings. Um, this one will have two swings that uh, are bucket seats for support for the children. And then this one over here is really unique. It's intended um, for children who's not, who are not capable, who don't have the muscle strength to sit up. Um, and it'll be a flat dish that kids can still swing in, but they're in a prone position lying down. Yeah, the beautiful thing about that swing, too, is several kids can file on there and swing together. Yeah. And then as we continue through the park, we have an area for balance. And so you've got the stepping stones that the kids can walk across. It's like a balance beam. Um, and then, of course, handrail for them for uh, being able to support themselves. And then this is also a balancing feature as well, that they're able to walk across onto the balancing wall that extends across with the stepping stones. 
I just want everyone to check out the port in place detail and some of these things. Pretty amazing. As we move into this portion of the park, what you'll notice here is a lot of sensory, um, sensory that's designed for very little ones as well as older children and their families. And this is one of the sensory walls that, um, that is designed actually around Spokane in our region uh, called Custom Designs. And it incorporates things like the marmots, we've got squirrels, we've got bears, snakes, what all, very tactile which again is really important for, um, for this population working with them. Um, and it also gives an opportunity, again, for some of the bigger kids to move through, as well as parents. And there are some really neat features in here. Like if the kids look through this looking glass, actually the view is of the butterfly on the other side of the park on the North Bank, which is really neat. Um, and then we also have um, sound mechanisms. Speakers to be able to spin. And then we also have um, the falls, the lower falls and the Monroe Street Bridge, as well as the Blue Bridge that's factored into the customization of this design. And for the little, little ones, you know, little sea otters, and then these reflective pieces too, uh, to catch their eye and very, very tactile. And then we also have sound as well. Over in this area is the sand table. And again, very reminiscent of Spokane in the Spokane region. So we have the image, the illusion of the falls in here. This will be filled with sand. We've got the sandbox on the other side. Uh, the other thing that I want to point out that when you finally are able to come to the park that you'll notice right off the bat is the way that the port in place is graded. As Jen and I are moving through the site, you know, there are these gentle slopes that continue to slope up that are purposely designed to challenge the kids, and yet nothing exceeds a 5% uh, grade um, that would be problematic for them for accessibility. This here is a little cozy. Hiding places or, you know, that are uh, visually accessible are really important to the kids. Having a safe space to just kind of uh, go in, but yet they can look through the holes, um, you know, and, and uh, play with one another that way. We've also got benches designed in along the side throughout the entire playground actually for family members to be able to sit or interact with their kids as well. Same thing with the seat ball here in the pathway. It's just perfect height for sitting. And this is another sensory wall designed more for the smaller children or kids in wheelchairs as well. And so on both sides of the panel, there are these opportunities for sound making and also for interacting and moving these types of um, play elements around. And again, that's working the fine motor skills for kids. And that's will cognitive eye, hand eye coordination. Mm -hmm. Same thing here. We've got hand eye coordination and the opportunity to play with one another and see one another through this, uh, through this little wall. You've got kiddos that need more visual stimulation. These two particular panels are wonderful. And as we near this portion of the park, there's the Sway Fun Boat. It's fully accessible. So kids in wheelchairs can come up, uh, up this ramp. And there's plenty of seating for them to be able to get a wheelchair in. And the boat actually rocks. Right now it's locked in place, but uh, it also rocks, which again is you know, part of uh, working with that particular aspect of, of the kids. And then um, you know, children that don't need wheelchairs can sit on this side, or their family members that need kids with wheelchairs can sit on this side. We're all also at grandparents. They, they can as well. And then over in here, we've got the rope pole. And this is working with upper body strength and building that upper body strength. 
sweep, and this is the steepest part of the uh, playground. As it slopes up, and then again, you've got the different colors of the port in place that are reminiscent of the river and sand beaches, as well as lawn areas that are represented in the port in place. And then the last piece of equipment that we have is um, this table, which is a roller table. So that it actually rolls, the kids can lay on it and pull themselves through. And that again is another good one for uh, working with strength and mobility. Yeah, this is uh, proprioception, um, tactile stimulation. This roller table is really great. I think the very last thing I would comment on is the shade sails. Um, you know, in our climate, we need to be able to provide shade um, for the kids. And so you see these real playful shade sails with the butterflies on them. All right. Well, again, we'd really like to thank you for your time and your interest in the playscape. And uh, this is just going to be a, a tremendous uh, playground for our region. And uh, we'd really like to thank all the people that were part of making this happen. Um, we had a wonderful donor in Providence, uh, the foundation that stepped up. Shane's inspiration is a huge part of it. Um, the city of Spokane. And uh, it's going to be really exciting to see kids and their families come from all around the region and enjoy a really unique place day. Thank you, everyone. Well, Ann, that was a good video. I do have a couple of questions that came in. Um, one of them is from Larry, and it says, what is the manufacturer used in Riverfront Park? And if you don't know, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you hear me OK? Uh, no, I think you're still muted. How's that? There you go. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your question, Larry. Um, there are a number of manufacturers uh, that are part of the Playscape in the park. Um, Gorick is one of them. I believe LSI was another. Um, Ken, feel free to chime in on uh, other other manufacturers within the, the Yeah, and the, the shade canopies were, were by Skyways. Um, so those yeah. are the three major manufacturers for that. Place. LSI is uh, Landscape Structures Incorporated. Yep. Thank you. And then we had another question uh, from Jeff. Uh, are the fish in the port in place pre-manufactured or formed no. on site? Anybody? No, they were, they were formed on site. And I have to tell you, the team that uh, did the port in place were phenomenal. They came up from uh, California. It's all they do. And they spent about a week doing the port in place. And they put so much detail into it. Um, I really encourage you, when you go to the Playscape, take a look at like the fish have eyes, the butterflies. I mean, it, it, the level of detail is just, I've never seen anything quite like it. And uh, I, this is a funny one, um, but from Barry Ellison, the question is how much should I expect the budget for a playground of this, like this? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question, actually. Um, yeah, budget, uh, budget is one of those things that I think a lot of people, uh, grossly underestimate the cost of playscapes. And, um, and it's really critical that you work with your team um, early on, figure out what is a realistic budget uh, for what it is that, that you are hoping to achieve. And, um, you know, and then work through this entire design process. Um, I think right up front, a, a responsible design team is gonna help guide you in terms of their knowledge about what it costs to put a playscape in. Um, and I, I know that you have a lot of experience with this too, get, given the number of playscapes that you have designed and installed over your career. Mm -hmm. um, you know, feel free to add in, you know, words of wisdom there. Yeah, we, we uh, in, a, in house have done some number crunching on the various types of playscapes and, and for a nature-based playscape, you could be looking at anywhere from 
you know, 10 to $25 per square foot, depending, could be more, depending on the design of the playscape and what your goals are. Um, a traditional playground, post and platform, wood chips, containment, that sort of thing, can run somewhere in the 20 to $35, maybe more. Um, but inclusive playscapes, um, they, you know, could be beyond that, yeah. So, or yeah. probably will be beyond yeah. that. So again, um, as just as Ann said, to go through that process, talk about costs up front. I would also um, recommend to think through what your priorities of that playscape are. What are the priority pieces? Um, what do you really want to spend money on? What can you spend a little less money on? Um, what can be phased? Um, sometimes phasing doesn't make sense. Sometimes it does. It just depends on the project. And that can help. Yeah, and I think um, also just knowing right off the bat that some of some of your most expensive elements are the safety surfacing. I think people really underestimate the cost of safe, safety surfacing. Um, wood chips tend currently tend to run right around twelve to fifteen dollars a square foot. Um, tiles go up from there. Um, the lawn, um, the synthetic. Uh, safety surfacing lawn uh, is right around 25 and port in place is right around 38 uh, square foot. Um, so, so that's a big, uh, big ticket item. Um, shade structures, uh, if, you, if you do the shade sales, that's another fairly big ticket item. And then some of these customized play uh, pieces of equipment as well. I think you did a good job. Barry added a little bit of information on for those that are listening. Um, this particular area is 1.3 million and it's 8,000 square feet plus an ADA restroom. So we'll let them folks take that. But uh, I do think it's a, uh, a great question and, and uh, you addressed it well. Yes. Um, Thanks for have, asking that, Barry. We have um, time for other questions if anybody's interested. So please shoot them to me and I'll share them. Other than that, uh, I think that uh, you guys did a wonderful job. Thank you. We'll give a minute here for anybody else that might have a question. If not, then maybe Stephanie will take it. <laughs> oh, we wait. Here, got one question from an anonymous attendee. When will the park be open? <laughs> now that's a that's a that's a double. That's a really good question. <laughs> Scheduling wise, right now, based on uh, some manufactured deliverables, uh, it's intended somewhere around mid September for the area that Ann was just showing you. As far as the rest of the park, I'll let the city decide that or tell us. Well, we still have time for a few more questions, but uh, in the meantime, until any others come in, I just want to go ahead and thank our presenters, Ann, Jenna, and Ken. Thanks for all your um, expertise in this particular topic. And um, it's uh, great that we can bring this live, local, and remote webinar this is the fourth one that we've done and AAI Spokane wants to do them once per month. We've got a commitment to do that. So any of you out there that have particular topics um, or thinking of a good building tour that we could do remotely, um, please email me and uh, we would love to get you guys on the calendar because it's, uh, it, it, it's a great way for us to connect when we can't connect in person. And um, so I, we've gotten a lot of good feedback. We want to keep these going. So please send me your ideas. If there's nothing else, can any more that came through? Yeah, we do have one more question about dealing with COVID in a playscape. I think that's all new to all of us. So I'll, if you guys have any words of wisdom, I think everybody's willing to listen. <laughs> uh, m myself coming from uh, predominantly nature-based um, uh, values uh, as far as playscapes go, I, I think that, that nature-based play settings are going, to be be are going to become more important um, in our new COVID world. Um, for a variety of reasons, and, and playscapes themselves, um, we're out in the fresh air. Um, plastic, steel, those sorts of things need constant cleaning. When you have uh, wood materials, um, wood materials um, are antimicrobial, and they actually self-sanitize in about 24 hours. So if you've got playscapes or outdoor classrooms that have wood materials as their predominant materials, to some extent, they self-clean themselves. Um, now, there's not a lot of outdoor classrooms. Nature play is sort of a new thing, especially in Spokane. Um, but I, I do think that these two um, 
settings will provide a lot more ability for us to bring play to children, to bring learning outdoors, um, to hopefully to a little greater extent to have schools more open, that sort of thing. So uh, that, that's my perspective from a nature-based one. I think it's a good one. <laughs> That's a, that's a tough one because, you know, this is new territory for everybody. And I don't know that, um, you know, we're, we're discovering new information all the time. So I, I think you answered it very well. Yeah, we're as all best as we can right now. <laughs> Figuring it out as it goes. Okay. Anything else, Ken? Any other questions come through? Uh, nope. I think we're good. So thank you, everyone. We appreciate your time. Yes, and one last um, note, if you do need credit or you would like a certificate of participation, uh, just please email me at office at AIASpokane.org. I did put it in the chat field, open up the chat, um, and uh, I'll make sure and get you credit or get you a certificate. So thanks again for everyone for joining. We had great participation today, and uh, we'll see you at the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.